Homo Cat here. The next episode of the Friday Zone is going to be a lot of fun. I'm not kidding. Hey guys, it's Olivia and we're at the IU Science Fest. They are going to shred paper up. They're going to go run around the exhibit. We're all going to feel sad at some point in our lives. It's very normal. So keep an eye out for the next episode of the Friday Zone. Right meow. Production support for the Friday Zone is provided by... The WTIU Children's Programming Endowment. Ensuring quality children's programming for future generations of Hoosiers. Learn more at indianapublicmedia.org slash kidsfund. The IU School of Education, dedicated to improving, teaching, and learning in a diverse and rapidly changing world. More at education.indiana.edu. Smithville Fiber, the GigaCity Company, a philanthropic community partner since 1922, and proud supporter of numerous community organizations. More information at smithville.com. WFYI Public Media, inspiring Indiana with high quality educational content since 1970. By sharing stories and connecting people, WFYI inspires the best in our community. And these Indiana Public Television stations. Thank you. Hey Cassio, what's up? It's my little brother. He's been acting like a chicken again. Your little brother's been acting like a chicken? Well, are you trying to get him to stop? Heck no. My mom's really been liking the eggs. The week is done and it's time for fun. There's room for everyone in the Friday zone. So much to see. Who will we meet? It all happens magically in the Friday zone. Welcome to the Friday Zone, everyone. I'm Cassia. And I'm Ethan. We've got an animal invasion happening on today's episode, Cass. Yeah, we've got an animal craft, a field trip to the zoo, and we'll meet a giraffe on All About Animals. Plus all eight unicorns. Right, on, on the, the Friday, Friday Zone playlist. <laughs> Because I'm feeling great. I'm a unicorn and there are only eight. All eight unicorns, all eight unicorns. Would you like to come over and play with me? Yes. No. Yes. Yay. All eight unicorns, all eight unicorns. We're unicorns and we're galloping and we're singing our song that we love to sing. It goes all eight unicorns, all eight unicorns. All eight unicorns, all eight unicorns. Huh? MG, everyone stop. There's a unicorn there, but she's tangled up. How did this happen? It's really bad. I don't, I don't even want to say. It's too embarrassing. <gasps> All right, even on more. the count of three, let's just pull, okay? One, two, three. Pull, pull, pull. Let's dance around without a care. We're super cool, because we're super rare. All eight unicorns, all eight unicorns. All eight unicorns, all eight unicorns. The end. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Lexi. Hi, Felix. Hi, Felix. So guess what? Guess what? 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 My friend came into class the other day, and he was wearing glasses. Felix, do you know why kids wear glasses? <gasps> no. <laughs> why? Why do they wear glasses? Well, some kids have different shaped eyeballs. <gasps> really? Yes, they're not all perfectly round, which they're supposed to be round. Oh. But some kids have shorter eyeballs. Uh-huh. And some kids have longer eyeballs. Oh, wow. But why do they need glasses? Do, they, do, do glasses change your eyeball? Well, not actually, Felix. 
glasses change how the light comes into your eye. Because oh. when you see a picture, it's actually light rays. Oh. See, right here. Yeah, I don't get it. Yeah, I don't okay. get it. One second. All right. Okay. So when, you, when light comes in your eye, it hits the perfect spot at the back of your eye for a perfect picture. But when kids have different shaped eyeballs, the light doesn't hit that perfect spot anymore. It either is too short or too long, so their picture's blurry. Oh, I see. So, so with glasses, the picture isn't blurry anymore. Exactly. You have a clear, perfect picture. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Oh, thank you guys so much about teaching me about glasses. You're welcome, Felix. Today, Isaiah and Oliver are going to show you how to make paper bag animals. You will need two paper bags, a black marker, a pencil, construction paper, scissors, googly eyes, and glue. First, cut ears out of the construction paper. Then, cut an oval out of the construction paper for your animal's belly. Glue the ovals onto the middle of the bags and the ears at the top. Draw a nose in the middle of the top part of the bag, as well as a mouth. Then, glue the googly eyes just above the nose. There you go! Isaiah and Oliver have made a terrific tiger and an adorable dog, but you can use your creativity to make whatever animal you want. Hey guys, it's Olivia and we're at the IU Science Fest. We're gonna check out some cool science experiments. Let's go! We're here with Jesse and he's gonna explain what we're learning here. Okay, so in this room we have three different stations. Um, one station you get to look at animal skulls and look at the different traits that they have to see what they tell us about how the animals behaved when they were alive. So another station we have is you can actually compare your skills with the chimpanzee and race against it in a cognitive test to see how you would do against a chimpanzee in memorizing numbers. And lastly, we have a station where you can build neurons um, and learn kind of what they do in the body and how they work. And you can actually take that home. So what is a neuron? So a neuron is a cell in the body that sends signals. So if you want to move your foot or move your hands, your body is a system of neurons that go through and send signals so you can actually do that from your brain. So neurons kind of look like this thing with fingers and then a long body and some more fingers. So a signal comes in from this side, goes through the axon body and actually sends another signal. So that's kind of how it sets up this network. Okay, and so the race against the chimpanzee, what is that and why are we doing it? Okay, so the race against the chimpanzee is looking at how our brains work compared to other animals. So what you'll find is that this chimpanzee is really good at memorizing numbers and kind of going through this test. So you get to test yourself against that to see how your brain is different from the chimpanzees, but also how it's similar because you can see that they still recognize the numbers and go through it. Hey guys, we're here with Nyla, and she's going to tell us what she's learning from the game that she's playing here. Okay. Um, I'm learning about like how animals memorize stuff really fast, and memorizing stuff, it's fun. Yay. I just what? got here. I've just been playing this game. It's really fun. What, what do you do in the game? You memorize the numbers, and once you hit the first number, they all disappear, and you're like, where's the numbers? Oh, no. So do we want to play around? Yeah, sure. Okay, let's try it. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, okay. Three, four, five, six, maybe? Oh! <laughs> hey guys, I had a lot of fun here at the IU Science Fest learning about chimpanzees and how their brain works and learning about neurons. I'll see you guys next time. Cassia. Okay, no monkeying around, okay? 
we got to go to the zoo on this Friday Zone field trip. <laughs> hey guys, it's Olivia here and I'm at the Indianapolis Zoo. We're here to see what everyone's been going bananas about. Let's go! what she does here. I work with primates here at the Indianapolis Zoo, so most specifically the macaques, the lemurs, the gibbons, and the baboons. How many macaques do we have here? We have 31 different distinctive personalities here on this exhibit. Um, Graham, you can tell him apart. He is the largest of the macaques out here. He is quite a stubborn male. Um, he does what he wants to do, and you kind of have to wait for him to choose to do it. We also have a lot of very young macaques and they are very inquisitive. So they're going to be the ones that you're going to see up at the glass. They're going to be the ones that are going to try and interact with you through the glass, which is very, very fun. So there are 23 species of macaque. One species is found in Africa, and then the rest are found in Asia. In the wild, macaques would eat anything uh, from fruits to vegetables to leafy trees and shrubs, um, but they are also going to be found along the shoreline, so they're gonna find stuff in the water as well. Um, these macaques, they are called long-tailed macaques, but their other name is crab-eating macaques. So they do eat crabs, they'll eat other kinds of uh, shellfish in the wild, but here at the zoo, we feed them fruits, vegetables, a little bit of monkey biscuits, and some other fun little enrichment items, sunflower seeds, peanuts, that kind of thing. What do the macaques like to do here? They love to play. They are very curious animals, so any kind of enrichment that we give them, they are gonna shred paper up, they're gonna go run around the exhibit, they love to dig and find things, they're very handsy animals. They also have this very interesting feature to them, they have cheek pouches where they will hide different objects that they have found that they don't want anyone else to have and they will hide those in their cheek pouches for later until they're by themselves and they'll pull it out and play with it. The macaques here are helping us to sort of relay the message of sharing one world, which means we need to figure out how to share our space with the wildlife. There are so many um, cities that are being built, a lot of housing developments, and it's pushing the wildlife out. And that's exactly what's happening over in Asia with these monkeys, is, is that they have had to adapt to a city life and so now they have become pests in their homeland. Um, just as raccoons and sometimes chipmunks or even rabbits can be pests here at home. So we're trying to spread that message that we need to figure out how to share our space with wildlife. What are some things that we can do to share our spaces with wildlife? Well, some things that we can do, um, more specifically, uh, you can build bat boxes for bats. They're very, very great at getting rid of pesky bugs like mosquitoes. Um, you can plant some natural um, flowers that are great for bumblebees. Um, bring the bumblebees back in. Um, you can also put out bird feeders, get some of those other birds back into the spaces as well. Hey guys, today we're with our friend Alex. She's a psychology student. Uh, Alex, what do you got for us today? Well, I am so excited to be here. Are you guys excited to talk about emotions? Yeah, we are. So awesome. Okay, well, to figure out what emotion we're going to be talking about today, I have a picture for us all to look at. Oh. What do you guys think she's feeling? What? Sad. Sad. Yeah, she's feeling sad. You're right. So, can I see everyone's sad face? Good. Very, be so sad. Very believable. So, so, Alex, why do we feel sad? Well, we can actually feel sad for a lot of different reasons, but the main reason why we feel sad is because of loss. When we lose something and, you know, we don't want to lose it, we can feel very, very sad. 
And the most extreme example of when we lose something and we don't want to is when someone passes away that we love. Like we might lose a grandparent, we might lose a pet, uh, maybe one of our friends moves away, and we don't want them to move away. So I'm sure you guys have all felt sad and you guys all have examples. Yeah, so that, I... that reminds me of uh, this a couple months ago. My, my cat back at home passed away and it was so sad for about a week afterwards. Me and my siblings were so upset because we had this cat forever and that made me feel so sad. Right, right. Um, when I was in elementary school, actually, I, um, I moved away from a lot of my friends and moved to uh, Chicago. So um, that made me really sad to like leave them. Yeah. yeah. Does anybody else have any examples of what made them feel sad? Yeah? Well, this really made me uh, very uh, freaked out. Um, once my brother chopped the end of his finger off. And oh, had to go no. to the that's, that's really sad. That's pretty that's sad. Pretty sad. That is sad. Because he lost his finger. Well, there's no lack of things that we can lose, and it makes us feel sad. Sometimes we just lose our favorite book or a toy, and we feel sad. But I think um, a big thing that we all have to remember is that sadness is normal and we're all going to have it. But there's a strategy that we can use to make us feel less sad when bad things do happen to us. And that's how we think about things, or in other words, our thinking style. So I have some examples that I can show you guys to kind of show how we can think about things and that can make us feel bad or it can make us feel good. So let's just take a look at a few sentences. Okay. I'm so sad I didn't get a good grade on my math test. This means there's something wrong with me and there's nothing I can do about it. Hmm. So that's, that, that makes me feel pretty sad. Yeah. If I were to think about that, I think it's really negative mm -hmm. yeah. and it just kind of points to the worst case. Um, and I actually have another sentence that I wanted to show that's also pretty negative. I'm so sad that I got a bad grade on my math test. The saddest part is that this problem will last forever. That's also very negative. And we actually know now that the people who feel saddest about their problems are the people who think that, one, because something bad happened, it means there's something wrong with them. Two, they think when something bad happens, it'll last forever. And three, when something bad happens, they think that there's nothing they can do about it. Mm -hmm. And that is just a very, very negative way to think about our problems. So can someone give me a more constructive, positive way to think about if you get a bad grade on your test? Um, a positive, we can try harder next time, we, we can, can try study harder, next harder next time, we yeah. study more, yeah. we can get better results, because then there's something you can do about it, so you're less likely to feel bad about it. Well, we're going to learn about different ways to deal with sadness yep. right after this. Peggy, Peggy girl child, it is time. Uh, Peggy? Uh, are you okay? Oh, I'm sorry, Zarg. I don't feel so well. Is the Peggy girl sick? Yes. Is it the Red Death? No, but I feel like death. I'm sorry, Zarg, but I don't think I'm up to reading to you. Could you read me a poem? Oh, uh, I... Please, Zarg, it would mean so much to me. Uh, I, I could get you a hot chicky soup or a hot water bubble. Uh, that's hot water bottle. Oh. And thank you, no. Just read to me. That's all I want. Right. Peggy wants Zarg to read. Is anything the matter? Uh, no, no, Zarg will uh, read to Peggy Girl Child. Hmm. Uh, 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 I know, hmm? I will recite a poem to Peggy. Hmm. One my dark mother Nestor used to read to Zarg when Zarg was unwell. <laughs> that would be nice. When I was sick and lay abed, I had two pillows at my head, and all my toys beside me lay to keep me happy all the day. This isn't a poem by E.A.P. Zarg does know other poems. No, it's nice. And, and, 
and sometimes for an hour or so, I watched my leaden soldiers go, with different uniforms and drills among the bedclothes through the hills. Ooh, who wrote that poem? Uh, some poet named Bob, Bob Louis Stevenson. Oh, you mean Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, may Zarg continue? Oh, by all means. Oh. And sometimes sent my ships and fleets all up and down among the sheets, or brought my trees and houses out and planted cities all about. I was the giant great and still that sits upon the pillow hill and sees before him dale and plain the pleasant land of counterpane. Good night, Peggy girl child. <laughs> right, right, right. B, I've got a big problem. What's wrong, Sammy? Miss Dearborn's flower shop was robbed. We have photos from the robbery that, uh, uh, from the camera that night, but the intruder is wearing a ski mask. Don't worry, Sammy. These cameras took really good pictures, and if we zoom in really close... We can see an eye? Yep, we can see the iris. Oh, wait, what's the iris? The iris is a thin, circular muscle in the eye. It lets light into the eye, and it's usually blue or brown. Like fingerprints, everyone's iris is different. Uh, I see, so we just have to compare... The, we have, just have to compare it to our suspects. Yes, Sammy, let's see. Look, uh... Number two... There's another one... Oh, wait, wait, look! Number three and the one from the robbery are the same! I've got them! Go, Sammy! Thanks to you all for helping us solve this case. See you next time! Hello down there! My name's Gideon, and I'm a giraffe! Whoa, 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 could the camera operator get my face in the frame? I know I'm a giraffe and the tallest animal in the world, but jeez, please show my face. I told my parents and all my friends I was going to be on television today. That's so much better, thank you. As you might have guessed, we're going to be talking about giraffes today on All About Animals. <laughs> We giraffes are interesting animals. Our scientific name is camelopardus, which means camel leopards. This is because of our tall structure and our leopard-like pattern spots on our skin. Hi, my name's Eric, what's yours? My name's Gideon, it's nice to meet you. Oh Gideon, giraffes are my favorite animal. Mine too, you have excellent taste in animals, Eric. What's it like to be so tall? It's pretty normal to me, I've been tall all my life. As a matter of fact, I was six feet tall when I was born. You have such long legs. I'm curious, can you run as fast as a horse? Because my friend Aubrey has a pony who says giraffes are slow. So are you faster than a pony? Pony baloney. We giraffes are faster than most horses and can run up to 35 miles an hour. We giraffes only have two gears though, walk or gallop. So what's up with your neck? Do you have a lot of neck bones? Oh Eric, neck bones are called vertebrae. And we have seven just like other animals and humans. Wow, how come I don't have a neck like yours? Because you're not a giraffe. Be grateful that you're not. It's not easy when you're only sleeping 10 minutes a day. 10 minutes? How come? They don't make pillows tall enough. Seriously, we don't need much sleep and we snooze standing up. Cool, I can't wait to tell my friends that I met a giraffe named Gideon. And I can't wait to tell my friends I met someone named Eric. My name is Gideon the Giraffe and we'll see you next time on All About Animals. Hey guys, we're back with Alex and our friends and we're going to talk about some more dealing um, coping mechanisms that we can use when we feel sad. So what can we talk about? So there are actually a lot of different coping mechanisms that we can use when we feel sad and it's important to know these because we're all going to feel sad at some point in our lives. It's very normal. It's bound to happen to everyone. So it's just good to have some of these on hand. And this is one of my favorite ways to deal with the times when I'm feeling down and not very happy. And this is what I call a journal or a diary. And it's pretty self-explanatory. The greatest part about this is that you can write about whatever is bothering you 
and it's private. It's something that you can write in, but the whole world won't see it. And it's better than not saying anything because then you're not just keeping it in. So do you guys, can you guys think of a place that would be a good place to put your journal? Um, what about like under your mattress? Under your mattress. Somewhere nobody can find. Do yep. you guys have any examples of somewhere nobody would find? Well, I guess then it wouldn't be so secret, right? <laughs> <laughs> In your closet. Yeah, in your closet. That's good. So what's the problem with bringing your journal to school or, you know, leaving it someplace where just anyone can find? You think there's a problem with that? Because maybe somebody could find it, And right? then read it. And, and then, then everyone it. can read it. And then yeah. it's, not, it's not very private anymore. So that's the whole point of this, is that we can keep how we feel private without other people knowing, without other people making us feel bad. But we still um, have this as a way to express ourselves. And you can draw pictures. You could paint, you could draw, you could do whatever you want. So I think just a good thing about this is that it's a great way to be creative and express how we feel so we're not bottling it up but we're not telling the whole world. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. You guys think you're gonna start journaling now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that would be good. awesome. Thank you so much, Alex, for coming and telling us about sadness and realizing how to cope with it. And thank you guys for joining us on the Friday Zone. Remember to visit our website, fridayzone.org, to watch past episodes, play games, and see behind-the-scenes photos. And remember to live, learn, and play the, the Friday Zone, Zone way. way. Why don't we all practice our practice? How sad. I think it's a Production support for the Friday Zone is provided by the WTIU Children's Programming Endowment, ensuring quality children's programming for future generations of Hoosiers. Learn more at indianapublicmedia.org slash kidsfund. The IU School of Education, dedicated to improving, teaching, and learning in a diverse and rapidly changing world. More at education.indiana.edu. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, a philanthropic community partner since 1922, and proud supporter of numerous community organizations. More information at smithville.com. WFYI Public Media, inspiring Indiana with high quality educational content since 1970. By sharing stories and connecting people, WFYI inspires the best in our community. And these Indiana Public Television stations. Thank you. Do you cool cats have the perfect idea for the Friday Zone? Want to share a hobby? Tell us about an event? Or let us know what's happening in your town? Then contact us on our website at fridayzone.org or send an email to zone at indiana.edu. Right meow!